Colleagues from the media, good afternoon. Two weeks ago, the chairman of the National Consortium on Research and Innovation of COVID-19 had shared with us on Indonesia's effort to develop its own vaccine. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is a member of the consortium. The MFA have continuously supported the development of vaccine for COVID-19 both with our own capacity as well as with the international cooperation. From the foreign policy perspective, the MFA have consistently and actively participated in discussion regarding vaccine norm setting. As you know, in various international forums, Indonesia has consistently called for equitable an affordable vaccine once it is found. In the development of vaccine, the MFA have also rendered support for pharmaceutical industries, both state-owned as well as private ones. In this regard, yesterday, I visited Biopharma, Biopharma in Bandung, together with the first vice minister of the Ministry of State-Owned Enterprises. Biopharma is one of the Indonesia state-owned enterprises that focuses on vaccine development and production. Biopharma is the biggest vaccine producer in Southeast Asia with a capacity of more than 3.2 billion doses per year and its vaccine have been used in more than 100 40 countries. Biopharma expertise and credibility has also gained international reputation. Last year, Biopharma has started developing folio vaccine in collaboration with WHO and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In 2017, Biopharma was also appointed as the center of excellence for vaccine and biotechnology development in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. So this is why today my guest is the CEO of Biopharma Indonesia, Bapak Honesty Bashir. Bapak Honesty will talk about the progress of Biopharma COVID-19 vaccine development and its international collaboration in developing this vaccine. Professor Viku is again with me today to convey some updates related to the management of COVID-19. Colleagues from the media, August, the month of August, is always an important month of, for Indonesia. This year especially, Indonesia will commemorate its 75th year of independence. August this year is also an important month for Indonesia diplomacy. Indonesia will hold the presidency of the United Nations Security Council during the month of August. This is the second time that we are holding the presidency of the UN Security Council during our term as a non-permanent member for 2019 2020. During the pandemic, the working methods of the UNSC has been undergoing some adjustment. But for Indonesia, the role for UNSC, the role of UNSC to maintain peace and stability shall remain the same and becomes even more relevant. Thanks God, during this pandemic, after waiting for so long, on the 1st of July, the UN Security Council adopted the UNSC Resolution 2532-2020, which underlines immediate cessation of hostility in all situations on UN agenda, request all parties to conflict to undertake humanitarian powers, request the Secretary General to accelerate COVID-19 response and update 
the UNSC on efforts to mitigate COVID-19. Prior to this, the UNGA, the General Assembly, had adopted a resolution much earlier, on the 2nd of April 2020, where Indonesia was one of the co-initiators for the UNGA resolution number 74-270 on global solidarity to fight the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. Colleagues, while we are focusing on the pandemic, the traditional threat to peace and stability shall not be forgotten. During Indonesia presidency last year, our team was investing in peace. Indonesia believes that peace should not be taken for granted as it needs to be cultivated and nurtured. Currently, as we continue to battle against one of the worst global pandemic, maintenance of global peace and security becomes paramount. While most countries struggle on addressing health and economic challenges, some countries face a greater burden as various conflicts still occur, creating instability amidst the pandemic. This not only complicates our effort for peace and security, it also devastates people in conflict-affected countries due to COVID-19. In the wake of these challenges, the UNSC must remain relevant and continue exercising its moral weight to address these security challenges. We have to ensure that our effort in investing peace do not fit in these times of pandemic. This is why this year, the Indonesia presidency at the UN Security Council is, or the team of the presidency is, advancing sustainable peace. I repeat, advancing sustainable peace, which reflects the Indonesian vision and role in the UNSC. Indonesia will advance three main messages during its presidency. First, uniting the UNSC by bridging the interests of major powers and fostering dialogue to collectively mitigate COVID-19 that poses challenges and international peace and security. Second, advancing sustainable peace in the post-pandemic world to not only expedite effort for economic recovery, but also ensure synergy between peace and sustainable development. Third, advancing global effort to address emerging security challenges during the pandemic, particularly cybersecurity and terrorism attacking critical health infrastructure. During our presidency in August 2020, Indonesia will preside 14 one for meetings related to conflict situations and issues, including on Palestine, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, Somalia, North Korea, Kenya Bissau, and strategic reports on ISIL. Indonesia will also hold several signature events in line with our team advancing sustainable peace. First, meeting on pandemic and sustainable peace. Sorry, first meeting on pandemic and sustaining peace. Second, meeting on the linkage between counterterrorism and organized crimes. This meeting will address rising terrorist-related activities amid the pandemic. Third, area formula on cybersecurity threat to critical civilian infrastructure. This meeting is also important as we see rising cyber, cyber threat on critical infrastructure during COVID-19, such as hospitals and airports. 
all these meetings are held in line with Indonesia priorities in the UNSC. On the Palestine issue, Indonesia will consistently reiterate our support and call on the international community to address the threat of Israeli annexation to Palestinian territories, including in the briefing on Middle East. Indonesia will also organize a meeting to listen to the Secretary General Strategic Report on ISIL. This is an important role for Indonesia in the UNSC, as we are the chair of UNSC's Sanction Committee on ISIL and Al-Qaeda. This meeting is also the largest meeting of countering terrorism in the UNSC. And during the presidency of the UN Security Council next month, Indonesia will initiate a draft document of the UNSC on combating terrorism, on prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration, or we call it PRR. And all above mentioned items are expected to be the result of the Indonesia presidency in the United Nations Security Council in August 2020. Colleagues, my next point will be on the economic diplomacy. Tomorrow, together with the Minister for State-Owned Enterprises, I will sign a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, between the two ministries. This MOU signifies the solid commitment to further strengthen cooperation, coordination, synergy between MFA and the Ministry of State-Owned Enterprises. It aims, among others, to strengthen Indonesia economic diplomacy to support Indonesian state-owned enterprises to go global. So the key here is glo go global. And then facilitate inbound as well as outbound investment that involve Indonesian SOEs and partner countries. And then to map out an exchange of data and information on investment opportunity for Indonesian SOEs. And as a follow-up, the MFA and the Ministry of State-Owned Enterprises will establish a joint team called Team Bersama BUMN Go Global to further synergize ex ex expansion on Indonesian SOEs in the global market. Colleagues, my last point this week is regarding the update of the status of the Indonesian returnees for yesterday, 15 July 2020. It is almost four months, 18 March until 15 of July. There are about 127,799 Indonesian returning home. Compared to last week, this is an additional of 3,606 returnees. A majority of the total returnees, or 90,571 Indonesian, have returned from Malaysia. This is an additional of 1,861 people uh, in the last week alone. As much as 25,378 Indonesian crews have returned from 35 countries. They arrived in Indonesia through five entry points in Jakarta and in Bali. An additional of 339 people have returned in the past seven days. There are also 11,850 Indonesian who have returned via self-repatriation from 55 countries. This includes one of the largest self-repatriation badges with 265 Indonesian returning from China last Tuesday, 14 of July. MFA continues to render assistance to the Indonesian abroad in need. Between 18 March until 15 of July, globally, 
Indonesian mission in all region have managed to provide 526,864 packages of basic need. In Malaysia alone, our embassy, consulate general and consulate working together with the Indonesian diaspora have distributed a total of 451,348 packages. And our embassies continue to monitor the development through all mission abroad. So that's all from me, and thank you. And now I would like to invite Pak Honesty Bashir to convey his briefing. Thank you. Pak Bashir, dipersilakan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Her Excellencies, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ibu Retno Marsudi, for giving me this opportunity to present in today's event. My appreciation also goes to the Chair of Expert Team of the National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation, Professor Wiku Adisa Smito. Colleagues from the international media, thank you for joining today's event. I do hope that everyone is in good health amid the trying times of COVID-19 pandemic. The breakout of COVID-19 pandemic occurred simultaneously around the globe has caught us by surprise. To date, the number of positive cases has yet to show a significant decrease in Indonesia. Consequently, it will claim more victims if not properly handled. One of the avenues to tackle the speed of COVID-19 is through vaccination. Therefore, ascertaining almost 270 million Indonesian people to have access to efficacious vaccine is very important. Biopharma, a state-owned enterprise established in 1890, is the only vaccine manufacturer in Indonesia. We principally produce vaccines to support the national immunization program. I take pride that Biopharma is one of a few vaccine manufacturers that has attained WHO pre qualification for its numerous vaccines. This has enabled Biopharma to utilize its excess capacity to export its vaccine to UN agencies and fulfilling two-thirds of global oral polio vaccine demand. We also have research and development capacities in collaboration with numerous organizations, both local as well as overseas. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to highlight biopharma efforts in the provision of COVID-19 vaccine. Besides engaging in COVID-19 vaccine provision, biopharma also manufactures PCR diagnostic kits, which I will also explain later. First, development of a local efficacious vaccine. The Ministry of Research and Technology, National Research and Innovation Agency, has established national consortium to develop COVID-19 vaccine locally, comprising of Ekman Institute as the lead, Biopharma, related ministries, institutions, and universities. The aim of this consortium is to develop COVID-19 vaccine prototype or six vaccine. Biopharma as industrial partner will collaborate with Ekman Institute to subsequently conduct process optimizations, clinical trials, and upscaling activities, and ultimately produce, produce it to the market after obtaining license from the Indonesian National Agency of Drug and Food Control, or BIPOM. The, current, the currently developed technology platform shall be compatible with biopharma existing facility, thus not requiring substantial investments. Development of COVID-19 vaccine by the National Consortium is a long-term project with several milestones. 
Ekman Institute will develop prototype clone as the first milestone and target to deliver this prototype by February 2021. Biopharma will subsequently continue the development by starting the establishment of master and working cell bank process optimization, production of experimental loads, and scaling up. Preclinical study will be conducted in second quarter 2021, followed by phase one clinical trials anticipated to initiate in third quarter 2021. If the outcome is good, we may have the vaccine available to the community by first quarter or mid quarter 2022. Second, international collaboration in vaccine development and production. Collaboration with, between Biopharma and Sinovac. Selecting appropriate international partners in vaccine development certainly needs to consider numerous aspects such as scientific consideration, possibilities for technology acquirement, and business deals. Sinovac, a biotech company based in China, has developed numerous products, particularly vaccines. There are several reasons why we choose Sinovac to be our partners, among others. Its hepatitis A vaccine, its hepatitis A vaccine quality has been the WSO pre-qualified in which not many companies are able to have their vaccine WSO pre-qualified. This is the evidence that Sinovac has implemented a robust quality management system. Sinovac, Sinovac COVID-19 vaccine development has advanced tremendously. The company has conducted the first non-primate animal test for COVID-19 vaccine with promising results and published in science. It is one of the first few companies to conduct first three clinical trials for human in this July. It has large-scale industrial, industrial capacity and experience to produce vaccine around the world for over 30 countries. Apart from technology adopted in the development of COVID-19 vaccine is an activated vaccine. Sinovac has adopted this platform during the SARS epidemic. Thus, under pandemic situation, where rapid response and speed are important for vaccine development, it is highly advantageous to adopt and establish an established platform technology with good outcome on the safety and immunogenicity profile from previous studies. Preclinical study, phase one and two of clinical trials have been completed. Sinovac is planning to enter the phase three clinical trial in several trial center centers in the world. Technology transfer of COVID-19 vaccine production from Sinovac to Biopharma is planned is plan while phase three clinical trial is being conducted. Currently, Biopharma is preparing phase three clinical trial in collaboration with Pajajaran University in Bandung, a National Institute of Health Research and Development or Balimbankes in Jakarta, coordinating intensively with National Agency of Drug and Food Control, BIPOM, of the Republic of Indonesia. It is anticipated that the preliminary result of this phase three clinical trial can be submitted for emergency use authorization by BPOM by quart first quarter of 2021. Collaboration between Biopharma and the Coalition of for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, or CEPI. CEPI's role in funding and coordinating vaccine development of numerous emerging infectious diseases and ultimately providing access to this vaccine in outbreak areas has been fundamental. Numerous COVID-19 vaccine developments have been funded by CEPI. One of CEPI roles is to identify potential vaccine manufacturers and to link these manufacturers to the developer of vaccine. Through these activities, a global manufacturer hub is connected to secure and stockpile COVID-19 vaccine. The government of Indonesia has encouraged Biopharma to support CEPI's initiative of global manufacturing capacity building. Under the guidance of the government of Indonesia, Biopharma has proposed to CEPI 
is excess field finish manufacturing capacity for this purpose. Through this collaboration, Indonesia will be in strategic position to support global demand for not only COVID-19 vaccine, but other pandemic vaccine should the need arise. Chevy is currently reviewing Biopharma's proposal. COVID-19 Diagnostic Tool Production by Biopharma Capacity of production in Biopharma for RT-PCR kits is 240,000 kits per month. The capacity will be increased to 1.5 million test kit and 2 million test kit on September 2020. We use gen target already in WSO list use in several countries. The target genes have been checked to Indonesian whole genome sequence thus uploaded to the site and found that to be 100% similar with the Indonesian sequence and in terms of specificity will be 100%. Other competitive advantages are local production as it will be easy to obtain kit diagnostic and distribute to all Indonesian areas. We still import several raw materials and the required time to arrive in Biopharma for production. Preclearance Medical Information or PCMI. PCMI is a pharmaceutical holding initiative to establish a platform that is able to publish health information digitally to ensure travelers meet health regulatory requirements through the PCMI format in the form of a digital medical certificate. The objective of PCMI, among others, is to provide a guarantee of authentication of all health services required for travelers in accordance with the protocols and destination countries to have efficient and effective health services in one-stop services and to facilitate travelers with digital health certificate and identification in accordance with applicable regulation in Indonesia and internationally. Our first step is to have the PCMI supporting travel corridor platform that is currently being developed by the Indonesian government in collaboration with various stakeholders. Thank you. And Bu, Ibu Retno. Well, thank you very much, Pa Bashir. Now I would like to invite Professor Wiku for updating us with uh, some information related to COVID-19. Prof. Wiku, dipersilakan. Her Excellency, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ibu Retno Marsudi, uh, CEO of Biopharma, Pak Honesty Bashir, and distinguished foreign media colleagues, in this uh, present COVID-19 pandemic uh, times, the world is seeing the rise of uh, science. And uh, once again, be in public health, virology, microbiology, clinical studies, communication, economy, public policy, even sociology, anthropology, and history. At times of an emergency, we all need honest, scientifically based real facts to bring up hope, calm, and clarity. Effort have been made to look for the right applicable seeds in vaccine developments. In Indonesia, whole genome sequencing has been done to identify the strains of the virus circulating in our domestic community. This is a promising first step in search for a vaccine. In order to pull this off, collaborations must be strengthened, and this type of efforts need to be done globally and collectively. The bad news is we, the scientists, were not prepared collectively. Not all of us are laser focusing on one point. Not many of us study more of what we global health and zoonotic disease enthusiasts call the disease of tomorrow. And not many of us learn lessons, even if it was online and free from the forgotten pandemic of the Netherlands in the 1918 book 
written by our own historians. But this is normal. Scientists are obsessed in providing the answer to all questions, to unravel mysteries of the world, furthermore, the universe. To do what we must accelerate the science as quickly as possible, find joint solutions, and build a cohesive global response. Our actions may be local, but our impact, not only our thoughts, should be global. Act locally, but impact uh, globally. Let me take you to travel times uh, to 2007, some of the 13 years ago, where the world saw a David and Goliath uh, battle that affected the world's ability to monitor diseases and develop life-saving vaccines when Indonesia rose in the global effort to find vaccines. And as a country, we are much indebted to Professor Makarim Wibisono, one of our legendary and exceptional diplomats who fought relentlessly to negotiate a fair and just vaccine sharing. Our diplomats work around the hours to develop and formulate a just mutual transfer agreement of virus samples that allow developing nations to have access to newfound vaccines. And we know that our diplomats that are currently in service will carry the same unwavering spirit. As I mentioned earlier, our concern is local. We want to save and protect our fellow Indonesians, make sure they enjoy immunity from new developed vaccines. But the impact of what we do has always been global. The world that is safer to live in, the world that enjoys a healthier life, collectively, equally, leaving no one behind. Now I will answer questions from the media. First from NHK. President Jokowi indicated that the peak of this pandemic would come in August or September. Does it mean the situation of COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia is now getting worse? Or do you still evaluate that the increasing number of patients is due to better capacity of PCR tests last week? We are anticipating the number of cases will be increasing due to a better testing capacity. In the early of June, Indonesia has succeeded to achieve the number of 20,000 specimen tests per day. Now, in order to fulfill WHO criteria of ideal capacity, Indonesia is striving to push it to the level of 30,000 specimen tests per day. We need to set an even higher target of not only 30,000 specimens, but even 30,000 individuals. As WHO stated it better, we should interpret a country numbers of case in incidence rate. With a population of 267 million, the cumulative incidence rate for Indonesia is 30 in every 100,000 cases. By July, Jakarta positivity rate has reached 6.87%. Now I would like to answer the second question from NHK. Tempo magazine reported that there are discrepancies in the number of people who died from COVID-19 between the government official report and data uploaded by many hospitals in Indonesia. Can you confirm this report and why has this case occurred? There are several data sources on COVID-19 data collecting uh, process. Namely, there are referral laboratories and hospitals. All the data from these sources are collected under the surveillance division of the Ministry of Health. Then, next being integrated with the National Task Force system. The COVID-19 daily briefing reports cases that are confirmed by testing. Data output from the referral laboratories came from specimen tests, which then will be concluded between the confirmed, negative, recovered, and inconclusive of COVID-19 categories. These are results of a PCR testing process, which we can confidently say are in line with the global COVID-19 reporting scheme 
while data from hospitals need further processing. The third question from New York Times, does wearing a niqab offer the same protection from the coronavirus as wearing a face mask? Why do some Indonesians insist on performing Islamic funeral rites even when the victim is COVID-19 positive? We need to clearly differentiate the function of face coverings and facial protection. Of course, you and I know that niqab is a sheet of fabrics and it's hung loose while in use. Just like any other daily wear, niqab has no protection means. If you could browse the WHO websites, every protective gear, including medical mask, has its own specification in terms of basic materials and design. Niqab also isn't designed the way clothes face masks do. We already know that the main purpose of the face mask is to block free airflow from entering our respiratory orificium unfiltered. In the 2001 study on the effect of the niqab veil on incidence of respiratory disease in Saudi women, researchers unexpectedly found that the bronchial asthma and common cold were significantly more common in fail users. Wearing the fail may have contributed to dense, wet spot close to the mouth and nose, which could facilitate the growth of the organisms that lead to infections. <clears throat> Why do some Indonesians insist on performing Islamic funeral rites? Well, I guess no one knows the answer to that but the relevant parties. However, if we look at it from the sociological point of view, we might be able to grasp that defined values have become part of human culture, beliefs, and tradition. It is permeated in blood sub subconsciously. The COVID-19 nevertheless has become such an in inflection point. I think uh, this is uh, pretty much understandable that it is still very hard for the people to accept to live by new norms, including the way we arrange funeral today, especially because it pertains to the deeds of treating the people that we truly love and care. Just like what we see in America, Europe, or pretty much anywhere around the, the globe, practically where people are denying to wear facial masks just because it disrupts our pre-pandemic liberty, habits, and way of life. From the government and public health perspectives, the health protocols must be reinforced. But you might want to bear in mind that we live in a diverse globe and different communities surely possess distinctive values that they hold on to. Nevertheless, health protocols are a key measure in breaking the chain of COVID-19 uh, spread. The fourth question from Sydney Morning Herald. I would like to know what the total number of PCR tests is for each province of Indonesia. The last numbers I have seen are from June 28th. The reason why I ask is that some of the provinces test less than 1,000 people per million and often it is just symptomatic cases. As per 15th of July, we have reached around 20,000 tests per day with 276 laboratories involved in the laboratory networks for COVID-19 uh, testing. With that number, all hospitals and public health centers prioritized PCR tests not only for the symptomatic cases, but also for people who had close contacts with the patients as a result of the contact tracing, including the asymptomatic cases. With the details, is uh, Jakarta possesses the highest number of the testing, which is more than 170,000 testing, followed by the West Java, more than 70,000, East Java, more than 50,000, Central Java, more than 30,000, and South Sulawesi more than 20,000. In addition, since Indonesia is an archipelagic country, 
and there are more than 17,000 islands. It is still a challenge for the government to maximize the laboratory capacity in each region. We make sure that all provinces have laboratories running for COVID-19 testing, and we also manage the referral system based on the location and ease of access for the other. The government keeps supporting all laboratories by providing PCR and extraction kits. The fifth question again from the Sydney Morning Herald. Would the government think about putting a price limit on private hospitals charging money for PCR testing? A maximum price. Some of them charge up to 14.5 million rupees. 2.5 million rupees is a common price. That is a lot of money. <coughs> I'm sorry. For someone on the minimum wage of four, 4 million rupees. The government is keeping a close look at COVID 19 examinations in all health facilities, such as state owned hospitals, clinics, and so on. Besides the highest rate limit for rapid test on antibody test, we acknowledge that there are isn't one for PCR examination. Similar efforts are being made for the PCR examination, which will be implemented in all health facilities in Indonesia. Testing price may vary from one region to another accordingly. If cost of accessibility, logistics, testing equipments, PPEs, cost of service on medical specialists, and other elements are taken into consideration. We are looking at fixing the price on the independent PCR examinations, as well as the distribution of kits in accordance with the demands of the community. We would like to avoid any attempts on commercializations of health services uh, all costs. The sixth question from Sydney Morning Heralds again. Why has the government stopped using ODP and PDP and now just say suspect cases. I would like to inform you that on the 13th of July, the Ministry of Health has published the fifth revision of the COVID-19 guidelines, which revokes the fourth uh, revision. Alongside with this, there are updates on the COVID-19 operational terminology, namely changes to not use ODP and PDP terms on future reporting. To refresh your mind, on the 11th of April, WHO had also revised the global classification scheme for global reporting that changes patient under investigation and person under monitoring to suspect, probable, and confirm. Looking at the mitigation development, the PDP that we used the terminology before will be categorized as a suspect case. Also, several things related to the operational definition of ODP in the previous period will be included in the criteria for suspected cases. As of COVID-19 is such a new and dynamic disease, we understand that such changes may seem sudden and disconnected. From WHO to the Ministry of Health, the task force and experts we need to be more clear on relying scientific terms for them to be more acceptable on a local context so that it does not disturb the ongoing learning process of the nation and the world. The seventh question is from Nikkei. The health ministry has streamlined the identifications of people related or affected by COVID-19 with WHO guideline. Will you also disclose the number of probable suspect deaths from COVID-19, even though it would not be classified as death from positive or confirmed cases? Thank you for the questions. Currently, the government uses several categories on COVID-19 reporting, which are confirmed, recovered, death, and suspected uh, cases. Until now, death cases that are announced for the public and are categorized from the confirmed COVID-19 cases. But as I addressed in several press briefings before, all of the data are being managed 
analyzed and used as indicators of mitigation and risk zonation mapping. This is all the media questions for today. We are very supportive toward innovation and development in vaccine, drugs, and medical diagnostic technology. Hopefully in several months to come, it will be more ready to be circulated globally to boost the global immune system, to bounce back from hobbles that pandemic has caused. Last but not least, the search for a vaccine must be done as it's best to establish a product that is efficacious, safe, affordable for everyone. Let me repeat what Dr. Tedros said a few days ago. There will be no return to the old normal for the foreseeable future. But there is a roadmap to a situation where we can control the disease and get on with our lives. The task force will move on to carry out the president's instruction last Monday. We will keep on strategically testing people. We will keep on tracing people who contacted the virus. We will improve our treatment methods to ensure more and more people recover. We will move on with the perfecting our zoning system. And yes, we will improve our communication strategy. Our communication scientists and experts are working as of today to build what the president dubbed as participatory communication that builds trust based on science and data to promote public participation and uphold national movement to observe health protocols. Vaccines are playing a huge role in any infectious outbreak. Everyone is waiting for the pharmaceutical industries to start its mass production. Nonetheless, it couldn't solve the whole puzzle of the crisis. Therefore, I urge all parties to contribute hand in hand in collaboration until the hurdle, the hurdle subside. Getting closer to August, the spirit of the independence needs to be searched. In vaccine development, it is clear that Indonesia does not only want to be the market, but also the producers. We move on so you can keep on. Thank you and stay healthy. I would like to return to Ibu. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have four questions and I'll answer one by one. The first question from the Associated Press. What are Indonesian manufacturing capabilities in terms of technology? Do you have the high security labs needed to safely handle inactivating whole virus or the capacity for messenger RNA like Moderna and Pfizer or the viral factor like Oxford? Are cooperating with Western companies or mostly Chinese about how to do this? As AWSO pre-qualified vaccine manufacturers, Biopharma has proven its track record and capabilities in biotechnologies. Biopharma manufactures both bacterial and virus vaccine. We have relevant experience in developing vaccines which use similar technology platforms as inactivated virus vaccines, such as pertussis vaccines and development of SIPV. Naturally, different biosafety levels are implemented depending on the pathogenicity of the microorganism. Our scientists also have relevant knowledge and expertise on mRNA, DNA, and viral factor-based technology. Some of our current facilities can be utilized to adopt these technologies when required. Biopharma is open for collaboration with partners from any parts of the world which needs to be in line with the company's strategy. The second question, also from Associated Press, will there be any totally Indonesian candidate possible or will there be solely partnership? Our current priority is to ensure the accessibility, affordability, and safety of the COVID-19 vaccine. In order to do this, we use two strategies. First, in short term, 
we explore collaboration with parties that have advanced in their vaccine developments, preferably at the phase two or three clinical trial, such as with Sinovac. The vaccine drug substance from Sinovac will then be formulated and filled in biopharma facilities. Biopharma is also in discussion with the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, or CEP, for the possibility of clinical trials and vaccine manufacturing collaboration. Second, in the mid to long term planning, Biopharma strongly support initiatives on national development of COVID-19 vaccine. As an integral part of the national consortium, Biopharma will ensure that the establishment of master and working cell bank process optimization, production of experimental lots, and scaling up are in line with timeline of national vaccine production. The third question from Kyodo News or ABC. How far have you gone on the development of vaccine with Sinovac? When will phase three of the clinical trial test take place? Can you give us an exact date? Will it take place in Bandung, Beijing, and another city in China as planned? What is the other city? How many volunteers will involve in both countries? Sinovac has expressed its interest in collaborating with Biopharma. Phase three clinical trial using COVID-19 vaccine from Sinovac is under preparation and will commence soon. Biopharma is collaborating with Pajajaran University in Bandung as a trial center and will involve the National Institute of Health Research and Development of Bali Bankas. The trial, which will involve almost 1,600 subjects, will be funded by Biopharma. Similarly, Sinovac will conduct phase clinical trial in numerous countries such as Bangladesh and Brazil, to name a few. The fourth question from Kyodo News. If the result of clinical tests in China and Indonesia are consistent, when will you plan to produce the vaccine? By the end of this year, how many vaccines will you produce at the beginning and how many will you produce annually? Biopharma will acquire technology transfer for drug product. Will phase three clinical trial is being conducted. Pilot lots will be produced to generate quality data. We are hopeful the vaccine will be available to the public by early next year. The quantity of doses to be produced will depend on the national needs. Perhaps this will be done in stages in which the first stage will likely involve high-risk population. Our only capacity for COVID-19 vaccines is 100 million doses right now is available based on of our existing facility. A new facility is currently under qualification and targeted to be operable by the end of this year. This new facility will have an annual capacity up to 150 million doses. So, the end of this year, Biopharma will have capacity is around 250 million doses. Thank you for this question. Good afternoon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pa Ones, for your briefing as well as for responding the question from the media. And thank you also, Professor Wiku, for answering the question and for conveying updates and information related to COVID-19. Colleagues, before I close the briefing, allow me to answer some questions extended to me on foreign policies. First, on the uh, South China Sea issue, thank you very much. I received many questions related to the situation in the South China Sea, among others from Sydney Morning Herald, NHK, Asahi Shimbun, Nikkei, CCTV, Kyodo News, and Australia Financial Review. Colleagues, Indonesia is concerned on the increasing tension in the South China Sea. A stable and peaceful South China Sea is the hope of every country. Respecting international law, 
including UNCLOS 1982, is key to make South China Sea a stable and peaceful sea. The position of Indonesia in the South China Sea is clear and consistent. Once again, respecting international law, including UNCLOS 1982, is key and it should be upheld by all. The position of Indonesia on Indonesia's sovereign right over our exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, is also crystal clear and consistent. It is inconsistent with UNCLOS 1982. This position is also supported by the tribunal in 2016. Indonesia underlines the importance for all countries to contribute in the maintenance of peace and stability in the South China Sea and call for all countries to refrain from action that may escalate tension in the region. And then on the question of medical facilities for foreign nationals by Australia Financial Review, colleagues, both Indonesian and foreign nationals who are tested positive for COVID-19 will receive equal treatment in various hospitals as referred by the government. As per Minister of Health Regulation number 238-2020, hospital expenses for treatment of COVID-19 patients will be borne by the government of Indonesia. If a foreigner experiences a symptom of COVID-19, she or he can contact the Ministry of Health hotline at 119 and go to the nearest hospital to get a PCR or rapid test at their own expenses. Next, allow me to provide updates on COVID-19 and foreign nationals in Indonesia, as requested by Moroccan Press Agency. Colleagues, per yesterday, 15 of July, there are 361 positive cases, 9 deaths, 252, 252 have recovered, 614 are suspect, and 328 suspect foreign nationals have been repatriated. And now I would like to respond to Nikkei and Kyodo question on the development of Chinese facing vessels taken into custody by the Indonesian authority. Colleagues, as I explained in my briefing, last, uh, last briefing on the uh, 10th of July, on the, sorry, as I explained in my briefing last Friday, which is on the 10th of July, on the 8th of July 2020, Indonesian Enforcement Agency have arrested two Chinese fishing vessels, namely Lu Huang Yuan Yu 117 and Lu Huang Yuan Yu 118 in the Indonesian territorial waters. After a series of investigation, the Indonesian National Police has arrested one Chinese supervisor. The, the arrest is made based on the alleged criminal action that caused the death and injuries of the Indonesian fishermen. And then the question by the ABC Australia regarding the status of Indonesian migrant workers abroad, including in Malaysia. Colleagues, protection of Indonesian living and working abroad, including the migrant workers, is one of the Indonesian foreign policy priorities. These priorities becomes even more relevant during the pandemic. And the magnitude of this priority is well reflected in the data that I mentioned in the last part of my briefing, including 
on evacuation, facilitation for repatriation, as well as support of basic need for those badly impacted. And then in regard to the question by Moroccan press agency and Kyodo News on the recent development of Indonesia travel corridors. The discussion on the essential business travel corridor are still going on. And we have received positive responses from many countries. We expect this arrangement to be launched in the not too distant future. I would like to again underline that strict health protocols, strict health protocols is of paramount importance in this arrangement, which is required to avoid unnecessary health costs for the people. To ensure that health protocols are well implemented, Together with many stakeholders, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is involved in the development of integrated platform for pre-clearance medical information or PCMI as elaborated by Pa Honest. So next is the question by Nikkei on the importance of ASEAN-Russia cooperation amidst and after the pandemic. Colleagues, Russia is one of the important partner for ASEAN, also in mitigating COVID-19. Even before COVID-19, health and pandemic preparedness is an important area of our cooperation. The joint commitment to address COVID-19 is further strengthened through the convening of the special ASEAN-Russia Foreign Ministers meeting on COVID-19 held on the 17th June 2020, in which I co-chaired the meeting with the Russian foreign ministers. I have elaborated the result of this meeting in my briefing on the 18th of June 2020. In addressing COVID-19, Russia can be an important partner for ASEAN to support the COVID-19 ASEAN Response Fund the Regional Reserve for Medical Supplies and Capacity Building for Military Medicine. As current coordinator of ASEAN and Russia partnership, Indonesia will continue to work hard to enhance our collaboration on COVID-19 and beyond. Now I would like to update on the latest development of Indonesia international cooperation in the fight against COVID-19 as requested by Moroccan press agency. Colleagues, as of 15 July, Indonesia has collaborated with 120 international partners comprising, com comprising of 11 countries, 12 international organizations and 97 NGO. We have also facilitated international business to business support for 15 entities. So colleagues, that is all from me. And once again, thank you very much, pa, uh, Honest and Professor Viku for sharing information in today's press briefing. And thank you also, uh, colleagues, to all of you for attending virtually in this week press briefing. And inshallah, I will see you again next week. So stay healthy and stay, stay healthy, stay strong and stay united. I thank you very much.